in my personal opinion, the single greatest advance in the healing arts in this century that we're still in was the discovery of therapy localization. To me, that was an unbelievably huge advance for healing arts. It came out of chiropractic, and it was um, uh, applicable to all, really all healing professions. And the two big things, the two of the hugest things that ever came out of applied kinesiology were in 1973, the vertebral challenge, and then following that, in 1974, the therapy localization. And I remember when the vertebral challenge was first discovered, um, and you, I was with you, I think, and you, you came to, um, I was at National College, and I used to go to Davenport when you were teaching at Palmer College in that day. And um, I remember you coming there and teaching about that. You want to talk about that a little? Yeah. Therapy localization happened again by accident. Um, early on, I found that people had a carpal tunnel with all the classic signs of the uh, wasting away of the, of the thenar eminence, uh, um, the weakness of the digiti minimae and the opponent's muscle, all the whole shot that you should know about a carpal tunnel came because the radius and the ulna spread apart from an injury or fall or something and the transverse ligament, which ordinarily has a little peak in it, flattened like that and it then would impinge on the median nerve which would then cause the subsequent entrapment. And I learned that if the muscle was weak on testing, either the digiti minimi or the opponent's muscle when we test it this way, if the patient would hold from side to side here, putting the radius and the on the back, putting that little roof back on the, the uh, transverse ligament, instead of it being like that, it would be like that, putting the radius which was like that together the patient would get strength return. And that was the original method of treating a carpal tunnel based on the disturbance. Now sometimes people with a hypothyroid thing get a lot of mixed edema, but usually they'll have bilateral carpal tunnels and it's because they're getting a mixed edema to accumulation of the tissue in the carpal tunnel, not from the radial ulnar separation. But fundamentally, that's, there are other signs, but the average carpal tunnel responded to that compression of the radius ulna, and that's a good standard way to look at it. I had an Australian woman professional tennis player come in the office saying she had a carpal tunnel, and I said, well, that's usually due to a separation of radius ulna. There's a little nerve that goes through there. There's a, like a little toy train going through a tunnel. If you crush the little toy trains, uh, the tunnel of it, and the paper mache, and the little toy train can't get through, uh, we got to put that peak back in there as radius ulna separate uh, should be pushed together. So uh, what I want you to do is to do this. And what I did, I, went, I did this to myself, indicating she suppressed it together. So I tested her muscle, and she did this. She touched it. And she said, and then I tested it. It was strong. She said, how could just touching it do that? I said, no, I asked you to push it together. She said, I didn't. I just touched it. I said, well, maybe it only needs a light touch. You know, I said, what the hell is that? I said, don't touch it. And I tested it was weak. I said, now, I'm going to push it together here and strengthen it. I said, now, I cracked it again to see if I can make it weak. I said, now, it was weak. I said, now, touch it. Just touch it. It was strong. I said, well, you're responding very well. <laughs> and I said, what the hell is that? And I, re I remembered that, and I, I said, well, then, what I'm going to do is make an adjustment on that. I'm giving you a wristband to wear, hold that together, and so forth. She went on to a very good recovery. But I said to myself, how good just touching it? And I sort of forgot about it. And unfortunately, uh, uh, my first wife passed away. She had a... Uh, uh, unfortunate situation where she had a had an open can of tomato juice, had a foil top that had been compromised, and the tomato juice, even though it was in the fridge, developed botulism. She drank the tomato juice, and unfortunately, uh, she had an infection of her bowel, and the bowel had to be resected that section of it, and it, the pap test came back botulism. But uh, she went on to a very good recovery from the surgery, but. 
The year after that, there was a malignant nodule behind the area which, where she had the surgery, and eventually um, she had a, a malignant tumor there that eventually metastasized and she passed away. And uh, we had uh, elected to lecture in Utah, even though she had been ill when, when, when she passed away, I decided to take my children skiing and about a month after, and um, uh, I was thinking about uh, the fact that she had passed away, and how could that have happened? There's none of the, that kind of condition in her family, and she had always been on a very good diet, and she uh, certainly didn't have any of the, the uh, historical uh, danger signs for that. She had, I, was, I was wondering to myself, how could that have happened? And uh, I was in the, my study at home, getting ready to go skiing, and uh, uh, I was mulling it over in my mind, what could have caused it? Uh, is, there, is there a reason for it? Uh, how come we couldn't find it when she had the initial x-rays and all that stuff at the hospital? Anyway, uh, my mind said to me, um, you're asking the wrong person. And I said, well, who do you ask besides yourself or the patient? And my mind said, you ask the patient to ask the patient. And I said, ask the patient to ask the patient? I said, you're talking in riddles, whoever, whoever you are. <laughs> and I said, no, ask the patient to ask the patient. And then I immediately thought of the patient touching him. I said, I think that's what that means. I started having the patient touch certain areas, testing muscles, and that's how therapy localization began. A combination of that Australian woman just touching and doing it by accident, and then the idea of what could have caused that illness, and asking yourself and the, your own mind sort of formulating the thought that to ask the patient to ask the patient. And that's, that's, and that's exactly how it happened. That then became therapy localization, which now has many different uh, methods, but that it was, the, again, the serendipitous, accidental, but accidental on purpose, observation of something, and then having seen something and wondering why was that, then putting that with another group of thoughts saying, why could that have happened? Then I said, I bet, I bet that's how you find it. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that's a way of finding cancer, but that's how it happened. That's where the thought process came from. Up until 1974, from the original inception of muscle testing and origin insertion technique in 1964, a lot of different techniques have been developed. And some of you were in practice in those days, and some of you, that was a memory of your childhood times in those years. Um, and not familiar with that, but if those of you who were practicing AK from the very beginning, um, and some of us were in school at those times, the techniques were almost like coming out every month or two, and certainly every year, Dr. Gretz Research Man would add more techniques, and we're having to remember all these different things. It was a neurolymphatic, it was a neurovascular, it was an acupuncture circuit, it was an emotional stress circuit, it was a spinal circuit. All these things were accumulating, and what we had to do was simply find a weak muscle and do all the five factors or the six factors of the IVF. And when therapy localization came along, it meant we didn't have to do them all. And there were more than five or six. There were a whole bunch of different things by that time. We could simply therapy localize to the different possible areas and identify where we could localize where the therapy needed to be. That was a huge advance. It was just an incredible advance. And those of you who have come to applied kinesiology since that time sort of take it for second nature that it's always been there, but it wasn't always there. And it was, it was unbelievable, dramatic improvement in our ability to treat patients with the tools we had. But what it laid the foundation for and what we've been able to do since that time is why I think it's really a, one of the finest, most um, outstanding and astounding uh, findings in healthcare in the 20th century. Therapy localization doesn't tell you what it is, but tells you where it is, and then you have to make a physician's judgment of that. 